he was doing so many stupid things all the time and I was also taking the same shit with him you know because he was drinking from the morning to the last uh, minute in the night he was drinking scotch coke the future as a rolling stone is very uncertain Whenever he put satisfaction, he was going mad, mad, mad. He was telling that Mick and Keith were writing shit. Zuzu! Arrived to the New York Eve was awful because his girlfriend, Linda Lawrence, was still there. And that's how it starts. Yeah, I think we, we look good together, yeah. And I think he always tried to look girls who look a bit like him, you know. Zuzu, the mysterious French enigma. No mere girlfriend, she emerged as a tempest in human form a singer, model, and liberated soul personifying the bohemian essence of the era. I had my hair cut like him, you know. He didn't like himself, and at the same time, he wanted to have uh, people who look like himself, which is quite strange again. Though christened Danielle Ciarlet, the name Zuzu, bestowed by the pages of Paris Match, suited her flawlessly. Adorned with a gaming haircut, an infectious laugh, and eyes that held a cocktail of mischief and melancholy, she ensnared Brian. He was doing so many stupid things all the time, and I was also taking the same shit with him, you know. And we didn't sleep for days and days and days, and once a week we were sleeping one night, and then Again and again and again, clubs and everything, you know, you know, night long or day long. Their initial meetings unfolded in a whirlwind of late-night Parisian jazz clubs and the psychedelic abyss of London. Brian, enticed by Zuzu's unbridled zest for life, discovered in her a muse and sanctuary, someone comprehending his artistic tumult and thirst for the mystical. Zuzu, reciprocating, recognized in Brian a kindred soul, a companion seeking meaning in a world often rendered banal. He was also having, you know, breakdown very often. He was crying at night. He was having, yeah, he was really, uh, he was, uh, he, he was, he wanted to have uh, uh, his uh, things, you know, yeah, to, he wanted to go to a clinic to, to be, yeah. He was playing guitar at home, but he was not really composing because I think he was not sure of himself. He wasn't sure that he was right. He wasn't sure that uh, what he was doing was good. Uh, and he had nobody around to tell him to go on, you know, to do it. As destiny dictated, their paths diverged. Zuzu, Craving her own artistic autonomy, retreated to Paris. Brian, caught in the turbulence of his inner tempests, plummeted into deeper shadows. Though their union was fleeting, its impact was indelible. Zuzu lingered as a muse, a whisper of a life unrealized, echoing through Brian's music and memories. I thought it was really funny. Never, I never listened to one album of the Rolling Stones in Brian's place. Never. You know, Brian was completely fan of the Beatles. I mean, all day long we were listening to the Beatles, or the Righteous Brothers, but never, never, never the Rolling Stones. You know Brian tormented himself because he couldn't write songs like Mick and Keith, whose compositions had moved the band on to a whole new level. The only 
person of the group who came to visit him was Bill. I never, never, never see Mick or kids coming to visit him. Never, never, never. No matter what anyone says, rock on. Whenever he put satisfaction, he was going mad, mad, mad. He was telling that Mick and Keith were writing shit and he couldn't stand the music they were doing. He said, it's not the music I wanted to do. You know, I made a group to do some uh, uh, blues and uh, rock and roll and, uh, you know, and uh, he said, look at this, it's vulgar, it's awful, it's uh, out of tune, it's nothing. Once a guitarist painting a kaleidoscope of sonic hues, Brian's playing became erratic, tinged with a melancholic edge. He retreated into the shadows of the stage, his enigmatic soul further eclipsed by Jagger's flamboyant theatrics. The public witnessed a brooding musician, lost in his own world, oblivious to the creative storm within. Brian Jones, the elusive visionary behind the Rolling Stones, embodied a tapestry of contradictions. A musical pioneer with an unquiet soul, he possessed a gaze that spoke of ancient mysteries and a smile capable of charming birds from their perches. Yet beneath the celestial dust of stardom, a sinister shadow lurked, an insatiable thirst that gnawed at his core, relentlessly seeking solace within the amber embrace of alcohol. <laughs> Dad, I was telling Brian, you're only 24 years old, you're not going to start now, you know. It's ridiculous, you should just drink a little bit less, you know. His liaison with the bottle commenced inconspicuously. A casual toast, evolving into an evening companion, then a morning crutch. The pressures of notoriety, the tornado of relentless tours, and the internal discord within the band momentarily found refuge in the depths of a glass. Whiskey, scotch, anything with a bite. Because he was drinking from the morning to the last uh, minute in the night, he was drinking scotch coke. Coke scotch. All day, all night, all the time. You know. It dulled anxieties stoked the flames of creativity, and cast the world in a beguiling, hazy hue. He was never drunk, because with the speed, you know, it didn't make him drunk, but he was yeah, really doing every stupid things you can imagine. The enigmatic Zuzu gracefully dissolves into the tapestry of the 60s, leaving behind a mere echo of possibilities, a testament to the transient beauty of love and the enduring might of music. I think he was not so happy. I think he was so, sort of sad. And I think also that when he was crying at night and that all those things were, you know, only symptoms. He was worried of so many people, you know, looking at him. And, you know, Brian was much more happy when he was alone. As for Brian Jones, the rolling stone with celestial wings, he continues to soar within the hearts of fans, his music resonating with the faintest remnants of a French muse. Or in the darkest night, no one knows. Yet, even amid the darkness, glimmers of brilliance persisted. His mastery of instruments, his unorthodox arrangements, continued to push the boundaries of rock. Reluctantly, he became a muse, inspiring his bandmates while gradually succumbing to the fumes of self-destruction. Brian Jones' tale transcends a mere rivalry. It's a saga of the human toll exacted by creative ambition. A narrative of dreams drowning in whiskey, of potential strangled by insecurities, it serves as a poignant reminder that even in the electrifying realm of rock and roll, shadows persist, and the brightest lights can cast the darkest scars. Under my thumb. Yeah, it feels all right. To be a pop star, I enjoy it uh, with reservations, but um, I'm not really sort of satisfied, either artistically or personally. 
the future as a rolling stone is very uncertain. Thanks for tuning in and hanging out with us. Don't miss the next episode. Until then, keep it rolling. He don't know if it's right or wrong. Maybe he should tell someone. He's not sure just what it was. Or if it's against the law. Something.